Uh, this is Crack and Joe, East of Java podcast for July the 4th, 2010, taped at the Lamplighter Cafe and Roasting Company in Richmond, Virginia. And fortunately today it's not 99 degrees. Uh, this podcast is not safe for work. It's available under Creative Commons license for attribution. And this is your host, Chris Martin, and with us we have Andrew Pauly. Hello. And the videotaping is for posterity. Is our official? <laughs> he's turning. The, you can't see this on the audio, but he's he's turning the uh, camera around. Silver Persinger, yeah. the Ken Burns of Richmond comedy. <laughs> so this is a, a joke writing and podcast recording session, which we didn't record the joke writing part, which Silver bitterly objected to that. And it meets every uh, 3 p.m. every Sunday at the Lamp Ladder Cafe and Roasting Company at 116 South Addison Street, just off West Cary and near the old GRTC bus barns. Convenient to carry time and the fan neighborhood. And occasionally crack a joke, uh, jokia, and uh, that, I think that's something we should like have a steel cage death match about. Is it crack a jokia, crack a joka? Schedules additional special sessions on Saturdays to accommodate schedule conflicts. You don't have to be a stand-up comedian to participate. Out-of-town comedians visiting the area are invited to stop by. Fans and newbies are welcome. Brief pause for car noise. Uh, Topics we've covered so far, the seven dirty words, fighting words, taboos, stand-up comedy etiquette, and uh, what I'm going to do right now is, is throw out for Andrew Pauly's delicate, delectation some possible subjects uh, for future discussion and, and his responses to that. Uh, one, thing I thought, one subject I thought was uh, time management for comedians. So it seems like a lot of people are, get overloaded. It's like I'm not getting, we have a, we have a Andrew and I are in this uh, comedy group collective consortium, whatever you want to call it, called the curmudgeons of comedy. And so far, shame, shame, shame. Other members of the group have not submitted their biographies, and I haven't. The only one who has is Andrew. And I'm not being negative about it, but I'm sure it's like these guys are all overloaded. You know, they're trying to maintain a normal life. They're getting out in the evening and going to open mics and this, that, and the other. You know, they're performing at the Funny Bone. So, you know, they just don't have time to write something. Yeah. Uh, well, a lot of people don't have time, it seems, to write new jokes ever. You know, like, <laughs> I mean, but I mean, a lot of, well, a lot of know, these see, guys have... That, that, see, that's a whole argument that we could get into. I mean, that could be a subject for a podcast right there. Yeah. Polishing versus proliferation. Right, make a new yeah. Do you just take the, do you just do the same set and, like, hone it down until it's, like, like a diamond? Or do you... Uh, you know, just sort of spew out jokes as much as possible and then come back in later and pick up the, the pieces. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's different for everybody. Um, I mean, I'm not very far into it. I know for me, like, I, you know, as, as short of time as I've been doing stand-up comedy, I want to I wanna write, you know, at least three new jokes every day. Now, will I use all of those? Well, will I use any of those? You know, some days not at all. But I, you know, I it, to me, I wanna I wanna keep producing something new every day. And if I, you know, like that's I mean that's a decent number I think to try to shoot for three, and then you know, even if you only get you know three or four per week of new, good new jokes, and my mine are usually really short, so I need to, I need to have a lot of them. Um, you know, You're not generally telling stories. No, no, no. Except maybe for, for the nineteen bit. wheeler, that's kind of a story. Yeah, that's that's a slight. Yeah. That's or, a, in a way, you know, your story about getting directions from Oregon Hill is kind yeah. of a story. It, it's not just <coughs> set up punchline. It's more like a series of. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess it's just different for everybody. And well, I mean, back to the time management thing. I mean, some some of these comics have full-time jobs which means a lot more than 40 hours a week and they have commitments with Family. uh, families you know wives and children and those kind of things and you know trying to balance out like hey I want to get out and do as much as I can you know versus you know I've got these commitments and I don't want to neglect 
people who depend on me. I mean, I don't, I don't have any commitments. I, I have a dog. Other than that, I don't have any. Um, so I, pretty much <laughs> the only things I, I have to do are, are to go out and do comedy as much as I can. So. Um, yeah. Well, some people can't even keep their commitments to a dog. I mean, yeah. we're well, not going to drag uh, Michael Vick into this story, but uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, if the, sh the humane shelters are filled with people who couldn't fulfill their commitments to a dog, yeah. so don't knock that. No, no. Well, no. if you write, you know, if you write three jokes a, a, a day, that's like a thousand jokes in a year. Yeah. And uh, what's his name? The guy who wrote the Zen, Zen and the Art of Stand-Up Comedy. Uh, that's his deal. It's like write a thousand jokes, do a do one hundred stand up uh, uh, performances. So in a year you'll have a thousand jokes. Um, and that and that's that's like Rob Loving from Washington D.C. says that write every day. They all say that. That's like that's one of those rules of stand up comedy. You call it conventional wisdom, uh, whatever you want to phrase you want to use. So. The, I don't. I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. Well, maybe real quick, can you know, we could both talk about um, writing practices? Like, do you have a specific? Well, time you write I, every day that or? was. See, I wrote, I wrote that down there. So <laughs> like, um, joke writing 101, suggested by Andrew Paul. Oh, okay. But yeah, that's uh, yeah. If you want to talk about that, I mean, see, here's my philosophy: is like, the a. I think these are like evergreen subjects. In other uh -huh. words. Like, if we come back six months later and, God willing, we're all on the planet and we're all both in stand-up comedy, you're going to have a new, fresh take on joke writing. I'm going to have a new, fresh take on joke writing. There'll be somebody else here in the mix. So, and these are subjects... sick of listening to us, so. Well, whatever. <laughs> you know. Our massive North American listening audience out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't have any problem with, like doing it now and then coming back and doing it. Whenever, I mean, we if can, somebody wants to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, we, or if you want, we can save it for when it's not. No, no, I, you, let's you know, let's strike while the iron is hot. Okay, well, how do, how do you do? You have a set formula or, or time period, or what? What do you do? For well, you? I would. My, what I'm trying to do is like write at least one joke a day for Twitter. But if I, like for example, I came up with like maybe five or six jokes about the that were related to the Fourth of July or the Revolutionary War. Or whatever. So I got hot yeah. for whatever, and that's a mysterious thing. It's like I don't know why. They just sometimes they just pop into my head. Uh, so like then I'll just put them up on Twitter, which is I sort of view that as a time stamp. And there was I told that joke right. at that given time because sometimes you'll come along and and because what I've discussed before about comedy geometry, there's only so many ways you can get from point A to point B. You might pick up the paper and find out that somebody else has, has come up, and that's happened to me. I've, I've had ideas for jokes, and I opened up the Washington Post, and on page two, there was somebody who told the same damn joke. So, like, I'm not going to do that one, because it's like, everybody's going to say, hey, they're not going to say he ripped off Chris Martin. They're going to say I ripped off this columnist in the Washington Post. So if I get something that's pretty good, I try to get it out there as soon as possible. I'll try to enter it, I'll write it down at dailycomedy.com. Especially uh, with topical humor, I mean, there's probably you know fewer routes yeah. See, than a more abstract concept. You know? I'll give you an example of that. I came up with a joke. Uh, the only thing scarier than Excuse snakes me. on a plane is poles on a plane. And that joke only worked for about two weeks after all those poles died in the plane crash. Mm -hmm. And now I think it would like take a while for maybe people to you know. So it's like it's dead. I'm not. I well, put you, it. You can reuse it for another plane <coughs> crash whenever that happens. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's that's just like my Canada Day joke. Every, like waiting around once for a plane year, crashes. Once morbid. a year, I can tell a joke, you know, a couple of jokes about Canada, you know, uh, and lose a few t followers on Twitter and a few friends on Facebook. <laughs> I did. I, I I I posted I posted that joke last year, and I had a woman from Canada who's not really a big friend, but I think she. She got pissed and she she dumped me. <laughs> what what is what is the old saying about if you can't take a joke? Yeah, you know it's like, which is why on Facebook and this could be social media is a whole another subject. But that's like I don't talk politics or religion on Facebook. Yeah. On Twitter, it's like it says NSFW stand up comedian. If you don't like it, you know get the you know half out of the room because I feel like if if you come on my profile page 
And there's a there's a picture of uh, of uh, Chewbacca sexually molesting Princess Leia. If you can't figure out, you know, what the subject matter of this is going to be, then you know you're too stupid. It's like an example. I I re this this comes back to years ago at the at the Bird Theater. There was a, a, I was in line to go see Last of the Mohicans, and that's like, what, 1993 or something like that? Yeah, and uh, the guy in front of me was chewing out the person at the box office because he thought he, he was taking his kids to, like, he had like a 12 year old daughter or something like that. And I think he thought he was going to, like, see Davy Crockett or Daniel Boone, you know, some kind of Walt Disney movie. And there are these scenes, like, where the Indians are tomahawking people and scalping them and throwing them off mountaintops and blah, blah, blah. And he was just chewing on this guy's, this poor ticket taker's butt. And right above him, literally about a foot away, was a sign that said, R-rated for scenes of extreme violence. So it's like, those people you can't do anything with, so no. just like, whatever. I worked, I worked at a, an, an ice rink, and like all the, when the movie Blades of Glory came out, you know, it was a comedy with Will Ferrell and John Heater, oh, wow. and it was pronounced. Um, all the little girls who did ice skating wanted to go see it because it was about ice skating, and their parents took them. And like immediately after, I was hearing all these conversations about how you know it wasn't appropriate for kids, and I ended up saying to somebody like, just because you are interested in that subject, doesn't mean that that particular film was meant for your ten-year-old kid. You know, like you, if you can't figure that out, then you know I don't really know what to tell you. But you only have yourself to blame for those kind of things. Yeah, if you're a Sarah Palin uh, buff and you go to see Nail and Palin and you're shy. <laughs> You know, you need to get out of the, jump out of the evolutionary pool. Yeah. <laughs> so, um... Shameless plug for a nail and There you go. Uh, so we were talking about joke writing process. So I think the, the thing that Twitter does for me is, is like it forces me to come up with a joke. It's like, okay, I gotta supply at least one joke a day on Twitter. Yeah. And, I wish I could be more prolific, maybe, and do three jokes a day. But I'm generally, if I can hit one joke a day, I've got five minutes yeah. by the end of the end of two weeks. Okay. Yeah, I'm so, kind of. I'm kind of like. Well, I, I shoot for like an average of three a day. I mean, there'll be days where I fill up, you know, three or four, you know, word document pages of of one liners, <laughs> and then I'll go for a couple of days and maybe not have anything, or just kind of work on the stuff that I've written down a couple of days before, you know, so, but I, I don't really have, like, a set time, like, in the day, like, you know, this time to this time is my joke writing time or whatever, I seem to write a lot, like, before I go to bed and, like, first thing when I wake up in the morning, and, um, and sometimes, I don't know, anyway, for me, like, the kind of jokes that I write, I just kind of look around the room or, like, if I'm out driving, you know, I just try to think about, you know, something I can find and maybe... It's obvious, but it's not obvious, you know, or something like that. And uh, yeah. next thing you know, you know, there, there's a joke or, or the seed of a joke or something. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I think there are like, the, there's what Jesse Thomas calls a low-hanging, or maybe it's David C. Wingfield, talks about the low-hanging fruit. Right. It's like, we really don't need any more jokes about um, using the F word in Twilight. Uh, you know, we don't need any more, more jokes about uh, who's that woman in Sex in the City? Sarah Jessica Parker. Looking like a horse. <laughs> you know, See, yeah, we all of, in, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my so, wife can't drive. All women yeah. can't drive. Blah, Asians, blah, blah. you know, can't drive. Blah, blah, blah. They take a lot of pictures, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then there's sometimes, though, to be honest, where I sort of glory in hacking, hack jokes. It's like that joke about the joke I have about uh, don't about the Battle of Bunker Hill, um, don't, don't, you know, the American commander at the Battle of Bunker Hill in the Revolutionary War, don't fire at the English until you see the whites of their eyes oh, their teeth. or the stains on their teeth. And that's, that's been done, you know, like jokes about West Virginia dental hygiene, jokes about English dental hygiene, that kind of stuff has been done, you know, time and time again. So yeah, you want to look for the, the less less obvious stuff that you can. I think so. Um, so, um... Yeah, but that's about, that's about, I mean, 
you know, just like and that. I think everybody tries to carry a notebook around so if, sure. if, the, if it pops up in their head. I used to keep a notebook by my bed, but lately I haven't really come up with much. You know, write, write. I mean, there are people that wake up in the middle of the night and write, you know, write I stuff. Know. There are people like, you know, having sex and, and like, stop. <laughs> Which, and then you wonder why comedians have such a lousy relationship track record. You gotta hold like, your pen in one hand and you're <laughs> like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I just thought as I was like, yeah, oh, yeah that'll, that'll work, that'll work, that'll kill a relationship good. <laughs> no. Yeah. That's not funny. Uh, yeah, that's, uh... that's like, that's, that's, that's worse than like, you know, the, the thing guys do, I think it's so freaking, it's almost as stupid as this is like, yeah, honey, I'm listening. Yeah, I'm listening, or you know, I'm doing it. Yeah, you know, that's a that's a good way to kill. I mean, tip, men. When a woman is talking to you, pay attention. Don't be fixing your bike or, or reading the newspaper or watching TV or whatever. That's assuming you want to keep her around. Yeah, assuming you want to keep them around. Exactly. If you don't want to, then by all means. Then by all means, be fiddling with something else. You know, if you can't figure that out. But anyway. So I guess it is a real test of a comedian is if, if you stop in the middle of... You have a joke idea during sex, please. please stop. <laughs> yeah, that, that really shows your dedication. Uh-huh. Or you have a very, 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 very understanding wife or girlfriend. Uh-huh. Or, you know, hey, not that there's anything wrong with it, significant male other. Um, so, I write a lot more jokes than I have sex, so I guess I'm, yeah, well, I'm doing all right. That that could be a whole podcast in no, I think you're right. I think that could be a whole series. There you go. So, uh, so my my personal feeling, and uh, not not just me. This is like Twyla Tharp, is who is a uh, is a ballet uh, uh, diva genius. Whatever she does, like ballets in the, in New York City. She has what she calls creative practice, and she. Or creative ritual, and she basically says, "Just keep doing it over and over again." And so, you know, the only way to get better at writing jokes is just keep keep writing jokes, keep writing jokes. You may not always, you may not like feel like writing jokes or yeah. coming out to a joke writing session, but if you only do it when you feel like it, you know. Well, yeah, you probably get you know fifty percent of the results you would have if you put you know one hundred percent effort into it. So, uh, so I think it does help to, if you're writing jokes to structure it. Well, and, and again, how you structure it depends on yourself, uh, on the individual. Everybody's creative practice is different. There are no quote unquote rules. There are people who write jokes on stage or you know work it out on the stage. Um, there are people who you know are doing like totally improv. Um, Acts. There are people who are doing like nothing but crowd work. Yeah. So, you know, whatever works for the individual. Uh, another one I've already I've written to Jim Zarling or Jim Effin Zarling <coughs> of Charlottesville about how to make uh, a comedy scene, how to make a scene, and just talking about uh, him. And Bill Metzger with the Comedy Roundtable, the CCR, uh, what kind of things they were doing to foster stand-up comedy in Charlottesville. Of course, Jim's also involved with improv, I think, in sketch. And then I know a woman named Christina Newton who runs Curated Culture, and she runs First Friday's Art Walk in Richmond, and I thought... Since they're kind of parallels, the art, a scene is a scene, whether it's art or comedy. I thought she might be a good person to have on and talk about how do you get artists networking and brainstorming and, and fostering things, get things going. I would think so. That'd be cool. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that Jared is sort of, one of the issues that he's kind of dealt with is you call yourself a comedian. <laughs> how and when do you become a comic? Do you like when you when you first get up on an open mic stage? Uh, when you first get paid? When you're making 51% of your income from comedy? 
when there's a comedian. Because he, he his point is that there are a lot of self-declared comedians. He runs into people at cocktail parties or whatever. And they say, oh, yeah, I'm a comic. And it's like... Because it's kind of one of those things like, you know, when are you a... Uh, when are you a liberal or when are you a conservative? Like, you know, I mean, you, 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 to some extent, you kind of define those words, you know what I mean? Like, I, I would think it's kind of, you know in your heart, you know, I guess, whether or not you're a comic. I mean, I think, like, people who get up there and they just hack, probably know deep down, hey, I'm, I'm a hack, you know, like, I'm not... I don't, I don't, I mean, for me, I don't think you have to be paid to be a comic any more than you have to be paid to be a guitarist, you know, or... or you know, to be, you know, to be a professional. But that's, I mean, that's my, my opinion. Well, yeah, you know, that, that again, that, that opens up another area in terms of, like, there are people who are relatively unknown, uh, like Ron and Bill, uh, who don't have a movie to piggyback off of, mm -hmm. or a TV series, and we name no names. Uh, yeah. But, you know, they're, they're artists, they're craftsmen, and they get up there and like kill for 20 or 40 minutes or 45 minutes but because they don't have that little boost or whatever that little jet pack uh, they're not as well known yeah. but uh, maybe like to Jesse you know they're like uh, the creme de la creme yeah. as opposed to other people who are maybe just trading off a notoriety or yeah, you, know, you get sort of like, and this is reaching way back. It's like you know, you're John Wayne Bobbitt, so like, you go out and do stand up comedy because like, hey, I got my penis cut off, ha ha ha, whatever. Or Glenn Beck. There's, Glenn, a, there's a joke. In there, so. Glenn Beck, where there's a joke off there. Or, Glenn Beck did a stand up comedy tour. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, is he a stand up comedian? He says he is. I guess he got people. I don't know how many tickets he sold, you know, compared to Jerry Seinfeld, but he did a stand-up comedy. Yeah, I guess I guess you could say at the basis level, if you can get stage time, you're you're a stand-up comic, you know. What I mean? But you know, I I think I think I could go up there and do some things, and I or or I could write certain things, and I would not consider myself a comic, you know. But like I try to write and try to perform so that I can call myself a comic, and hopefully other people will consider me a stand-up comic, you know. I mean, well, this, this relates to a choice I think that sometimes uh, comics make, whether they're aware of it or not. I think sometimes you can be witty or you can be funny. Yeah. You can go for the belly laugh or you can say something that's witty but that won't break up the crowd. Uh, and then maybe, you know, if you write enough of that, you can be David Sedaris. Yeah. But there are comedians I know, you know, who say things that I consider to be original or witty, but they won't necessarily evoke a belly laugh. Right. And I think both choices, I respect both choices. <coughs> yeah. Whether they may, you know, maybe they're not aware that they're making them. Yeah, no, I, I think a lot of people are probably conscious to some extent. I mean, I was, I was told not too long ago um, by somebody, somebody who's been really helpful, like kind of helping me out learning the ropes of comedy, you know, like you can um, you can you can do stuff that you know is going to get laughs because it kind of sub, you know subscribes to more or less of like a general formula that seems to work for you know the mainstream comic. Or you can kind of go out on a limb and try to do things differently, um, and you're going to have you know more consistent success if you go the first route. But um, you know, if you're, if you're really kind of drawn or you're just naturally pulled towards or that's all you can do is kind of go more in a different direction than the mainstream. Like, you know, you're going to fail more, but it's also going to feel really good when you do succeed. Um, so I, th I think there's probably, there's like different payoffs, I guess, no matter which way you go as far as a comic, you know. Like if, you're, if you're more of a witty guy versus more of a physical goofy guy, you know, you, you can do, you can do, um, you can have different kinds of success, but you're probably not going to always have the same kind of success, I guess. I don't know. Judy Carter talks about uh, comedy karma. She mm. says sooner or later, in her book, Stand Up Comedy, the book, she says sooner or later people tend to gravitate toward whatever it is that they want to do, like whether it's props 
yeah. or observational or whatever. And I, I you know, I, I could see. To me, uh, it's like if you want to be Larry the Cable Guy, I think that's a that's a valid choice. Um, well, you can get a lot of success for yourself, like financially and fame and all that, and, yeah. you, and you can make a lot of people laugh because, I mean, I'm sure Larry the Cable Guy is not going to come after me. It's kind of it's kind of accessible, lowest common denominator type of humor. Humor, um, you know. So, so, but, but you can do people a service, I guess, by by making them laugh that way. If that's what if that's what there's a demand for. Um, there's a lot. There's probably a lot bigger demand for Larry, Larry the Cable Guy than there is for um, David Cross. I know they've had a spat before, you know, kind of um, because their their style of humor is totally different. Their personas are totally different. And, um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, if you if you can, I guess if you can go out and make people laugh, like you're you're doing something good for other people, you know, and you can do a lot for yourself too. But you might you might get kind of stifled, I guess, if you're you know. If you take it really seriously, mm. there's a there's a there have been books on the science of happiness, and they talk about extrinsic goals versus intrinsic goals, mm. or external goals versus internal goals, and uh, so it's like if you chase after money or possessions or whatever, you probably won't end up being happy. Though in our society, that's the emphasis. But on the other hand, I also feel like it's like whatever you want. If you want a Porsche, yeah. that's valid. If you want a Corvette, that's valid. Whatever people want. I guess if I were had any particular bias, I would say just as long as you get off your ass and go after it. Yeah. Well, and I guess, you know, kind of take what you, like, assess. I, I would, purely my opinion, you know, take, assess what kind of tools you have at your disposal and then figure out how you can use them to get where or what you want. You know what I mean? Like, if you if you've got a really acerbic wit, you know, and you're you're really good with words, um, but you're also a really good you know physical comic, and you can do stuff that's you know more of a, like belly laugh stuff. You know, that's probably a, a, somebody in a really good spot because they can kind of choose or try to combine them to. I would think you know to to find wherever whatever is going to work best for them. Whereas. You know, some people probably don't have as many tools at their disposal, you know. Um, well, this kind of relates... I don't. Yeah, well, uh, but that kind of relates to... There's a book by uh, Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers, and one of the things he says is that it used to be that people sort of had the feeling like there's Mozart or whatever, that people have, like, innate talent. But now it seems like the, there's more of an emphasis on uh, the importance of, of putting time in to develop yeah. talent. Uh, like the Beatles spent a year in Hamburg, Germany, playing in a strip club, right. 12 hours a day. And his... Loaded on amphetamines and beer. Yeah. Well, we're, yeah we're, we're talking about time <laughs> time invested, not drugs. That's right, a whole right. other... That's, again, a whole that's another podcast. Yeah. Uh, but in that, like Mike, like uh, Bill Gates, he he had a unique opportunity that he had access to one of the few computers in the Seattle area. Mm -hmm. So he was able to put in a lot of time on computers back when you know it wouldn't be like you could go down to you know your local pawn shop and pick one up for two hundred bucks. So and his minimum was ten thousand hours, and it was to get really good. You need to put in ten thousand hours, and there are various, there are various, like Judy Carter would say, ten years to become a stand-up comedian. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a certain amount of time to become a sushi sh a chef. Yeah. Any anything you're going to try and do involves a skill set, and while there are some people who are naturally talented, the rest of us are sort of going to have to yeah. book it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I guess there's. I would. I mean, it's it's like a like a professional athlete, right? Like, there's there's people who are who really enjoy sports and really love it and have a passion for it, but they're never going to be a pro athlete because they just don't have the physical tools. I mean, I'm five six and one forty, you know, and like I'm. You're not going to be in the NBA. No, I was never going to be in the NBA, right? And there's guys that are six eight and two fifty and can jump through the roof, 
um, but they don't have like the drive to practice constantly. So I think there has to be a little bit of a combination of this natural, or probably a lot of natural, at least raw ability, and then somebody who's willing to kind of keep keep at it and practice it. I would I would think. I think that's the key, and in, in, it applies to everything. Uh, but I think like having been around for a year, I would say keep at it does have something to do with it because like, I've seen people get discouraged, they get tired of eating it, and they're not willing to keep doing it till they stop eating it. So there's maybe an initial period of time where they uh, are not willing to endure the discomfort involved in uh, getting up there and not being funny. Um, and like, I don't know, it's like, my personal feeling is like, if you get up there and you do five minutes and nobody laughs, then maybe you, know, you should get another hobby or whatever. But if you get up there and they laugh at something, then it's just a matter, and you've heard this from me before, it's just a matter of magnifying the part where they're laughing at. And then hopefully, you know, more and more of that will be the laughter part. But there are some people who just aren't, don't have the drive or the initiative. Or, and I understand that. I mean, it's like there are other things you can do. Yeah. It's not like, you know, find, go find a cure for cancer or, uh, you know, war peace or whatever. Whatever floats anybody's boat. I think, I think it does take drive. Yeah. A certain amount of stick, stick to it. I, th I think it's, it's uh, you know, just like any kind of performing arts, it is an art form. You know, and some, and some people aren't, I don't think, driven by like the, like a lot of people I think are really funny, but maybe they're not driven by like the creative process, you know, or like perfecting um, their craft, you know, the way a, you know, a musician can learn to play uh, songs, you know, anybody's songs, but like, are they really driven to be a really creative force and like grow as an artist and all that kind of stuff, you know, like, um, a lot of people could, you know, could be a decent portrait painter or like reproduce somebody famous, but like, who, are, are they willing to be, you know, somewhat original and groundbreaking and really push the artistic you know, process to its limits, I don't know. Um, yeah, I... And some people, that may, that may not be their goal, and they could still be really successful, but... Yeah. One of the things that, that, that people ask you, like, did you have fun, and I think that, that to me is something that... It just doesn't apply to me. Well, going back to what you were saying, yeah, there's a cliche in comedy that comedians are neurotics and they're, they're getting up there. It's like a desperate plea for attention or whatever. And it's like, we've discussed this before. It's like, I really don't care that much what audiences think of me. I mean, obviously, as a, if I'm doing comedy, I'd rather have them laugh than not laugh. But I, I'm not... I think you, you give up too much power if you like if you're worried about like what people think of you, whether what other comedians think of you, what audiences think of you. It's like maybe I'm the most brilliant comedian in the world, but like these people are too dumb to get it. Yeah, I'm not saying that. I'm just, yeah. that's a that's a hypothesis. Sure. Yeah. No. I. Uh, so I don't really get. You know, I don't worry uh, if one given audience. I mean, again, if I were getting up and eating it night after night after night, I say, well, maybe maybe it's me. But on any given night, just like with baseball or whatever, you know, sometimes you're going to hit it out of the park, and sometimes you're, you're going to strike out. Now, hopefully, if you're in professional baseball, you're hitting it out of the park more than you are you know, hitting grounders or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I guess comedy is probably tougher than baseball. You know, baseball, if you if you get a hit, what, three out of ten you're times? You're three, three, three. You're, you're astounding. Yeah, you're an all-star. Um, comedy, you know, you... You know, hopefully more often than not, I guess, you know, you're going to have a good set. Hopefully a lot of them are going to be great sets, but uh, you, know, uh, you can bomb a lot more in baseball than you can in comedy and get away with it, I guess. Yeah, and the other question that sort of comes up related to that is people say, well, so, you know, my feeling is like yours. I think it's a craft, it's a discipline, and it's, it's a performing art, just like ballet or music, and I don't think... Musicians particularly enjoy practicing. I don't think ballet dancers like uh, stretching exercises. 
I don't think they're having fun when they're at the whatever it is, the bar, and they're doing that dip. You know, that's not fun. No. It, it is not fun for me to recite a set until I can pretty much do it by memory. I mean, that's not to me. That's not fun. Now, are there are aspects of it that I enjoy. I enjoy going to new places. Uh, you know, I enjoy fellowship with other people who are performing. Uh, you know, and I'm sure if I ever got to be well known, I'd enjoy getting a better seat at a restaurant. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's it's I'm not in it for the fun. It's, yeah. Like I said, it's a performing art. Yeah. It's a craft. It's a discipline. It's a, it's a practice. I mean, why, what is a what is a I have ideas. I want to express them. Yeah, yeah. Or why, thoughts, or yeah, whatever. Why does why does a mountain climber want to climb a mountain? You know, the actual process of climbing a mountain. Pretty grueling. Can be yeah. It can be a challenge. You know, when you've got sweat in your face and your hands are bleeding and your muscles are twitching and you know you're about ready to give out. I wouldn't consider that fun. But you know, the whole challenge of it and the the process. Like to me, the process is yeah. It's not always fun. Sometimes it's actually really kind of painful. You know, or it can you know at least be frustrating. But, um, but I don't know, for me, it's like I, I started doing it and I fell in love with it and I knew this was like, this is what I want to do, you know, like, uh, and I want, I want to be the best I can be at it. And I think, I think hopefully that's probably a good attitude to have, like, take it, take it as far as you can take it. You know? Well, what, there's, a, there's, there are books about the science of happiness and one of the things they, one of the benefits, if you want to be quote unquote happy, one of the things, one of the keys is commit to a goal. And there's like a, 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 there's a, there's like a Swiss psychiatrist or something. It's like there are a lot of people running around moaning about this or that. And it's like, go out and do something. Yeah. Build a boat. You know, track down flying saucers. You know, uncover who killed John F. F. Kennedy. It's like, go out and do something. Yeah. Now, some of those I think probably would be stupid, but anyway. <laughs> the point is, they're committed to something, and, and it's not necessarily reaching the goal that makes you happy, but just the process of committing to it and the steps that are involved. Because once you're committed to a goal, you meet other people who share the same goals. Uh, you know, there's whole sort of like blowback or... Um, benefits from committing to a goal as opposed to just sitting on your couch and smoking, you know, reefer. Where when I say you, I mean generic reefer, right. I mean, you, generic person. Not, I know nothing about your <laughs> recreational habits. No, no. Well, there's, um, there's a book, um, oh man, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Have you ever heard of this book? Yeah, Victor Frankl. Frankl, Frankl, Frankl. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And you know, it basically says, like, you know, kind of his idea of like. Happiness is like kind of find find what it is that makes you know he was he was a was a psychologist or psychiatrist and he was you know he was, was a Holocaust victim and he was he was in a concentration camp and like you know finding his, you know his thing I guess was like his wife like you know he, his his way of like keeping himself motivated to stay alive was like so he could see his wife again and um, you know he, you know started the whole like logotherapy thing of like um, you know find what it is that is makes life worth living for you and then do it and maybe for a lot of people it's not a particular like creative thing or something but I you know wow we're getting into really like existential stuff here today <laughs> but yeah just kind of the idea of like you know if, if this is something that can drive you like yeah um, it, it can it can be something I guess that gives you like meaning you know Man Search for Meaning, isn't that his book? Yeah, yeah, Man, Man Search for Meaning. Well, book. Robert Fritz, who's an admirer of uh, Frankel, and who's written books on creating, the practice of creating, says that uh, one of the things that people tend to do is wait for meaning to come along and sort of hit them over the head. And instead, he reverses that. It says, go out and find something to put meaning into. Yeah. Uh, people are sort of waiting for their destiny to come along, and right. knock on the door, and uh, whatever. And uh, um, there's no right answer to that. It's like whatever it is that you choose to uh, invest meaning in or choose to love uh, rather than waiting around and 
sort of like sampling forever until, you know, this is because one of the things about the uh, creative process is like a lot of people will get in, they like the initial rush of like, ooh, you know, knitting, photography, whatever. And they get into it for a while, but then they reach a certain level and then it takes like some serious effort to sort of get beyond a certain plateau and they're not willing to invest the time in that. So then they move on to something else. And then again, that's, they get that initial creative rush of a new uh, hobby or subject. And uh, so it's just kind of moving around like hummingbirds. Yeah. So... Uh, Dead air, dead air, dead air, dead air, dead air. Sing a song. Sing a song, sing a song, sing a song. So that segment was comedy and happiness? Is that what you guys were talking about? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the, the the book I'm was the reading... Comics existence. Or there's, a, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of scientific study about uh, how you arrive at that state. And that, that would be... That's one of the things that, that I see comedians do, and they don't make the connection. Uh, but one of the things that the experts say about happiness, and I see comedians do this relatively often, is they compare themselves to other comedians. Yeah. And if you read a book like uh, How Not to Suck as an MC by Dan Rosenberg, that's one of the things he says is don't do that. But, and that's just based on his own empirical experience, but also based on the science of happiness research. It's like that leads to, in, you know, invariably there's going to be somebody that's better than you, no matter what it is. You know, somebody's going to have more money than you. Somebody's going to have more women. Somebody's going to have more cars. Somebody's going to have get more laughs. So better to it's set internal benchmarks of progress. Are you growing as a comedian rather than say, well, I'm not as good as. Richard Pryor, so fuck it. Yeah. And I mean, I've seen people get discouraged because they said, well, I started out, you know, in July of 20, not 2009, and this guy that I started out with is funnier than I am. Yeah. I give up. I name no names. But, you know, that's a good, I think that's a good way to, uh, and I mean, I'm not saying it's human nature, people are going to do that, but it's, if, I think if it's at all possible, it's not a good idea. Somebody once told me that, um, like, sorry, I keep scratching my nose, I've got a cold, so please excuse me. Um, uh, we were talking about, uh, like, passion for things, and he said, you know, um, and talking about, like, what are, what are people good at, or what are you good at? And he said that, you know, it, it seemed, his experience was that passion usually goes with aptitude, you know, like, like usually if you're good at something, you know, that's when you're more likely to um, to be like driven to to get better and to keep doing it, versus um, you know, like like let's say with sports, like let's say you're average at sports, you might really enjoy it, but if if you don't have some kind of somewhat natural aptitude for it, you're probably not going to develop the same kind of um, you know passion to like get better that that somebody who has some, somewhat of a natural ability. I, I think there's some probably truth to that. Um, you know, a musician or whatever, I mean, you know, uh, I, I'm a frustrated musician, you know, and I, I love listening to music and I enjoy playing it and stuff, but I'm, I'm not particularly good and I don't have, I don't have the drive to, to get better, you know, that I guess um, a lot of people who, you know, ha have some, uh, just a lot more aptitude, you know what I mean? Well, Malcolm Gladwell, I, I gather, and I haven't read his book, I've seen Say, you know, I've seen him on Charlie Rose and places like that. I gather that he would probably disagree with you. In other words, his, his perspective is aptitude can be acquired. So if you, if you really wanted to be a musician, mm -hmm. for whatever reasons, and you would do like Eric Clapton did, which is lock, him, lock yourself in the closet for 10 hours a day and play guitar, yeah. you'd get better. Yeah, maybe. Now, you know, I probably, you know, would you get as better, you know, as good as Mozart? Maybe not. Uh, it's sort of a, 
there's an interaction, I think, between inner, in, innate talent and the amount of time that you spend at it. Yeah, I think so. That's I don't think I don't there are people. There are people who are like uh, pitch perfect. You know, who, who can, who can, they don't need, they don't need a, a, you know, they don't need a little electronic bar on their on their guitar. They can just like, they can just like pull it right out of the air. Sure. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't think you can probably have too much success without a combination of both, you know, a aptitude and um, drive, you know, or, or, or will to to succeed or to improve or whatever. But uh, I, I, I have a hard time believing that anybody's going to get very far as an artist or as a performer, athlete, whatever, without having you know, a pretty strong combination of both. But, uh, but that's personal opinion, too. I mean, it's, well, then we're, we're, we're looking, we're lo the equation is drive plus talent plus time. No, I don't know. Yeah. I, um, and some people have more drive, some people more have more talent, and some people have more time because of what we discussed before, commitments to family, career, yeah. whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, time, all, all those things are variable, you know. If you, you, could, you could have very little talent and have a whole lot of time doing comedy or whatever. And Gladwell would say if you have a lot of time, then you can... Develop boost, it. Boost your, develop your yeah. talent. But, I mean, you know, some, some people... People that I respect who have talked to me about comedy have said, you know, you've got to be, um, you've got to be a good writer. You've got to have some, you know, level of, you know, pretty good intelligence, and you've also got to be an entertainer. You know, and, so, and some people usually, I guess, have when they start out or even you know their whole career have more of one than the other. You know, and they try to balance them both. But um, you know, it, I I have a tendency to believe, you know, you can be the greatest writer or have the sharpest wit in the world. But if you get up there and you can't um, find some way to deliver it in a funny way, you know, you might be a great writer for, for a show. What or about something. Mitch Hedberg then? But he had a great delivery. I mean, you know, he, uh, But that's that's like, uh, you know. It was I, very. I think it was very endearing to people. You know, I, I mean, I, I think it worked for him. I think it was pretty singular. But I, I, I would not say that Mitch Hedberg didn't have a good delivery. I'd say it was very distinct. You know, I mean, that 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 would be my opinion. He had stage fright. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people do, and I think some people. But if you go, if you go to like a, a lot of comedy clubs or competitions, they'll judge you on quote unquote stage presence, yeah. and stage presence is you know people being comfortable Confident. on stage. Yeah. yeah. And you and I know, and we name no names here. There are people who are very dynamic, very comfortable on stage, and their jokes suck. Yeah. They can't write. But they get laughs because they're. Well, sometimes they get laughs. Be, yeah. Oh, there's people making, you know, millions of dollars that get laughs on that, you know, naming no names. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, uh, well, it's also, I guess, it's kind of like what, you know, what do you put value in? Like, do you put value I'd in rather, the score? Myself, I'd rather have, I'd rather have, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather um, see, see original material. Um, Delivered by somebody who's terrified, yeah. than to see to see somebody really smooth. Uh, His jokes are just kind of Leno-esque, yeah. uh, delivering kind of hacky jokes. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, the that's guy, just my value system. The, the guys I like, I would not say. Pretty much all of them, none of them, I would say, are really high energy or particularly um, confident type guys. And I'm definitely not. I mean, I'm I'm scared to death up there. Um, but, but see, here's the deal. If you believe Gladwell, uh -huh. if what you really wanted to do was be high energy, you could remake yourself and become a high energy comic. Right. Well, I, I mean, I don't necessarily believe it. But, but also, I mean... I do. Yeah, I know you do. I'm, I'm saying, like, that's, you know... I'm not I'm saying not, you have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying... I'm not, you know, it's like Demosthenes on the beach. Yeah. It was not a naturally... He was a great speaker back in ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. And what he would do would be walk on the beach with a pebble in his mouth. So that's my argument is if you if you do it enough. Yeah. But I mean you like, can become a great Like for me personally like I don't, I don't really care so much about stage presence, you know, in, in that respect. I, I my focus is on writing the best jokes I can. 
and getting to the point where I can look at the crowd most of the time as opposed to looking at my feet the whole time. I mean, that's, you know, as long as I can get them to laugh, that's, that's what I'm going for. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not trying to force you to be something that you yeah, don't want to be. I know, I know. But I'm just. I'm just. Or just for the sake of discussion, yeah. Socratic dialogue, whatever. Yeah. My well, feeling is possibly maybe down the road, uh, you might decide. Well, I've gone as far as I can go in terms of like writing original material, and now I want to work on my stage <coughs> presence. I want to become yeah. a dynamic Las Vegas Showman. style comedian. Yeah, well, that's possible. Or not. Yeah, well, the, po the point I was getting to was, like, you know, you were talking about the judges judging on stage presence and stuff. But, I mean, to, for that to matter, you kind of have to put value in, like, what a judge thinks, you know what I mean? Like, you have to, you know, you, it, has to, it has to matter to you that this guy thinks that I'm less than this guy because of this particular style or something, you know? So... Well, so. that relates back to what I was discussing about giving power to other comedians or yeah. giving power to the audience. And it also relates to what Robert Fritz, Fritz says about... Uh, uh, creative works is only you can be the in the end only you can be the judge of your creative work. Yeah. When does a painter totally when does a painter decide I'm through painting I finished this painting? Well, he says so. Yeah, no, I, I I completely agree with you there. Or I, it's like, well, gee, uh, I'm gonna be doing something at the Cafe Diem on Monday. It's finished. Yeah. Because I gotta <laughs> read it over and over again. It has again to be, yeah. To, to, to memorize it, so it's like, I mean, I'll tweak it in between then and Monday night. But that's a nice thing about a joke is you don't, what you I, don't sell it to anybody. You, know, you can keep you can keep redoing it. You know? My set at this point is what they call in the record industry a golden master. Yeah. Words, that's, that's pretty much what I'm going out. to town with. Yeah. So another to other topics uh, for future sessions, uh, previews were social media for comedians, Facebook, MySpace, Twitter. I know it, my dentist is a big social media expert, and if I can get him to do it for free, I thought he could come and talk about it. Free root canals, too. Yeah, right. <laughs> Why you wait. Um... Do you need a website, uh, graphic design for comedians, uh, maybe uh, how not to become an alcoholic with a substance abuse expert, because a fair number of comedians are alcoholics. Free speech, I know some people in the American Civil Liberties Union, maybe we could talk about free speech issues. Oh, I'd love to do that, that would be great. Women in comedy, why aren't there more women in comedy? How do you get more women into comedy? Blah blah blah. Uh, taking rich. I was just gonna say that sounded like the setup to a joke. I'm sorry. Feel free. No. Uh, or getting comedy into women, getting comedians into women. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Uh, taking Richmond stand-up comedy to the next level. That'd be good. Promotions, promotion for comedians. Care and feeding of open mics, mm -hmm. and probably some other subjects that uh, I, we've discussed that I need to listen to the podcast and write down. So our next our next topic would be what's been going on in Richmond comedy in the past week, yeah. and Sunday City Dogs. Oh yeah. Uh, canine comedy at City Dogs. Jesse Jarvis got pulled. He was the last one to show up, and he, as he came in the door, he got pulled on stage. So that was, that was fun. I think Odyssey tends to do that. Yeah, like, I think that's, uh, that's, that's kind like, of his, <laughs> kind of his thing, I guess. Spanking. <laughs> yeah. I didn't think. But well, Jesse, to be Jesse did a good set. To be good. fair, I don't even think Jesse was necessarily expecting to uh, perform. Yeah, I don't know if he was either. I don't. I don't think he was on the list yet or anything. So. Uh, but he did a good set. It, it worked out really well. But uh, it was uh, it was funny. But that that was a that was a fun show. Good hot dogs too. Yeah, I was still doing my. Uh, I have Alzheimer's and I'm reading from the script thing. Oh yeah. I don't think I did particularly well, but you know, I, one of my things that I've discussed before is like desensitizing myself to uh, bombing. Mm -hmm. Judy Carter mentions that in her book. Yeah. So it's like, okay, I don't think it's going to be last. 
you know, I, the other thing is I wanted to, I wanted to try something new. I've sort of been doing the um, Dennis Miller and now the news type stuff, and I've got some other things I want to do. Not now because it's not strategically. Uh, I'm not strategically able to do it, mm -hmm. but I want to do some some different things right, like. Well, I just like I want to do my my tribute to Miles Davis, and I want to like read my set with my back turned to the audience. Oh, okay. Um, man, I don't know whether I should discuss the other stuff because then it's like yeah. gives it away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, exciting, oh, I thought thought about like doing a set from a year ago, mm -hmm. and it was like you know <laughs> balloon boy jokes. And, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, It'd be fun just to see what's still relevant, you know, or what people remember. Not much, probably. Yeah. But I mean, I have, you know, like I've da I date my sets, so I could theoretically like do a year ago set, and I'd just be interested just to see what the reaction would be. <coughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. See what, see what stands up, you know, just as comedy, just in general, and what's relevant, and, or what people stick, sticks out in people's minds or whatever. Because I'm sort of, you know, one of the things that uh, Jay Sankey says. In uh, Zen and the Art of Comedy, uh, is being philosophical and sort of looking at things from the perspective of the long haul. So it's like, I, and especially now that there are a lot more open mics, I don't feel as much pressure to sort of um, get it right each time. Yeah. So I like to just sort of very change it up a little bit. Uh, though I'm, I probably wouldn't, I don't know, it's like, I'd be interested in maybe doing magic, maybe doing props, um, Mixed down the road, yeah. Try something. Yeah. yeah. Would you, do you see yourself as, is like now and until the end of time just doing straight up observational stuff, or? I would, I would say so, I mean, I, I mean, who knows where anything will go, who knows if, I mean, you know, I could a year from now I could have been run out of Richmond because people are sick of listening to me. I mean, that, anything's a possibility. I would say that the kind of humor that I've always been drawn to is pretty much what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. I don't. I mean, I, I would hope. I would like. I would like to think that you know, a year from now I'm still doing comedy and I'm. I've taken it further than I have so far. You know what I mean? And I've kind of, I've kind of become more original than I am. I think I'm fairly original, but there's a lot that draws from a lot, you know, from a specific style. And I'd like to, I'd like to carve my own niche in that style. Or, hello, make something else happen. So. Um, yeah, well, I think that's, the, but I think that's true of anybody starting out. It's like, yeah. you know, how many, how many people start out in their basement, you know, trying to be the Rolling Stones somebody, or yeah. Aerosmith or whatever particular era. You know, how much is you know, Lady Gaga sort of ripping off a of Madonna, whatever. Uh, so yeah, I don't think that's necessarily, everybody starts out with comedy gods or whatever. Yeah, like derivative, yeah. Though, I, I, you know, that's one of the things that I sort of tend toward is, uh, there's, a, there's a book called, uh, about Zen called, If You Meet the Buddha on the Road, Kill Him. Mm -hmm. And I sort of feel, and I understand there's like hero worship, but I sort of like feel like kill your comedy gods. Mm -hmm. It's uh, cast off your chains of oppression, whatever. It's like that Facebook group. Uh, um, uh, what the, what the, what the, who's the guy who came before that stand up? Bill Hicks. Bill Hicks, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Bill Hicks is dead. Get over it. So, I was like, it was like I was in the. I love you, Bill. Uh, from beyond the grave.